me just a second. Good evening everyone and thank you to the Bible study that we're going to uh, be doing tonight and it's going to be a talk on the woman with the issue of blood which we can read in Matthew chapter 9. There's two small chapters referred to the woman with the issues of blood that is chapters or sorry verses 20 to 22 but really we'll go back to uh, verse 18 to 26. Would you like to read that for me? Matthew 9, 18 to 26. Jesus heals a bleeding woman and restores a girl to life. When he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hands on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch this cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowds and the people playing pipes, he said, go away, the girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowds had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. News of this spread through all that region. Thank you. No, what we see here, verses, uh, you know, we're not reading right through to verse 33, but between verses 18 and 33, we have yet more evidence that stacks up that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus restored life to a dead girl. Uh, and stopped a woman's chronic hemorrhage. Now, then he heals. Then he goes on to heal two blind men, and a demon possessed man, who was unable to speak. Imagine de so demon possessed, you weren't able to speak. But also, even imagine the woman with the issue of blood. Twelve years. Can you imagine twelve years going on with this happening day and daily? Now. No matter what our needs and how desperate our situation uh, is, we can always bring our needs to Christ and trust him to meet them completely. He will meet us. All we need to do is take everything that we have to the cross and he will meet us there at the cross and we can leave everything at his feet and he will deal with it for us. His unlimited power has proven sufficient for any situation we could possibly face. And no matter what we're going through, people, he's seen, he's seen it all. He actually knows what we're going to th go through, what we're going to do even before we even think about it ourselves. So nothing will shock or surprise him. And we can take everything to him in prayer. Now, in Luke chapter 8, verses 43 to 48, it's explained the whole crowd heard her explaining to Jesus why she had touched him. Can you imagine the embarrassment, the hurt that she was feeling having to explain before a whole crowd, why she touched, why she had the faith to touch just the hem of his garment to be healed. Now, sometimes our acts of faith need to be shared with many other people. They really do. And the more acts of faith you see, the more likely you are to step out yourself in faith and even give part of your testimony or give glory to God about the healing you've had. So the more, as I said, the more acts of faith that you see, you will uh, more likely to step out in faith yourself. In Matthew 9, 
verses 20 to 22. It's the shortest account of the woman with the issue of blood. As I said, two verses, two small verses. Here, I believe Matthew seems to think that her healing happened after Jesus blessed the woman. Because when he asked her, you know, who touched me? And she said, you know, uh, it was me and explained why she touched him. He then blessed her. Matthew seems to think that it was after he blessed her that she was healed. Whereas Mark and Luke write, the healing happened as soon as she touched the hem of Jesus' garment. And I believe too, that's when she was healed, was this very second, the very split second, she touched the hem of his garment, she was healed. Now, maybe Matthew was distracted by the crowd. Maybe somebody was talking to him. Maybe he dropped something, bent down to pick it up or something. And he'd actually missed the moment of the miracle. So he's only going on on what he heard the woman say about why she touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Either way, the important thing is she was healed. And we can be healed today. We can be healed. Not all our healings are going to come in the physical. A lot of our healings are in the supernatural. And uh, uh, he, just healing is supernatural and giving us that peace that we can endure anything. Leviticus 15 uh, and verses 25 to 27. Um let me see, where is Leviticus? Here is Leviticus. I should have had this marked, but I didn't. Let me see. Leviticus 15. Would one of you like to read that? Fifth, Leviticus 15, 25 to 27. I'm trying to find it. <laughs> Hang on. I'm going to have to go to the... Okay, I'll go with it then. I've got it. If the menstrual flow of blood continues for many days beyond the normal period, or if she discharges blood unrelated to her menstruation, the woman will be ceremonially unclean as long as the discharge continues. Anything in which she lies or sits during that time will be defiled, just as it would be during her normal menstrual period. If you touch her bedding, or anything on which she sits, you will be defiled. You will be required to wash your clothes and bathe in water, and you will remain defiled until evening. Now, what a way to treat a woman because of her menstrual cycle. And this poor woman had this menstrual cycle for not a week, not a month, but for 12 years. That's a long time, so it is, that she had to endure all that being unclean. She wasn't allowed to leave the house. She wasn't allowed, as I read in Leviticus, and that's way, way, way back, long before Christ uh, was born and uh, 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 did this miracle healing this lady. Uh, she would have been a, a, a total outcast. So for her to leave the house that day and go and join the crowds of people waiting to see Jesus. If somebody had recognised her, she could have literally been stoned to death for, for, for being out of the house. So she took a great big le leap of faith and going out because she'd heard about Jesus. She heard that uh, 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 his, his, his miracles, that he was healing people, and she had faith. Now imagine her enduring that for 12 years. Never mind just the issue of blood flowing for 12 years think how tired she must have been how fatigued she would be just how worn out she would have been but also all the nonsense that she had to endure about uh, uh being unclean she must have really felt terrible probably today a lot of people would have been maybe near suicidal i don't know and nobody wanted to be around her as i said she couldn't go out in public she couldn't even hug her family. Doesn't say how old the lady is, but imagine she's maybe in her 30s and she's maybe young children or grown-up children. 
and maybe even grandchildren because uh, in in, in bi biblical times they married early and had children early not being able to hug anybody that is bad she was in quarantine for 12 years we're going absolutely stir crazy being in quarantine off and on and up and down at uh, the past what 15 16 months she was in quarantine for 12 years and not only was she considered unclean but I'm sure she felt it as well. I'm sure she just felt horrible. Think about the task, having to have clean clothes and underwear. And I don't know what they use for sanitary protection in those days, but having to get rags and things for sanitary protection for 12 years. No washing machine. Uh, none of the modern conveniences and everything that we have today, ladies. But um, she had... Do, do it all maybe she wasn't allowed to leave the house so I don't know who went and did her laundry and things for her. maybe she paid somebody to do it I don't know but who would want to touch her bloody garments and she really must have felt awful now she had tried to get well she's as she told uh, uh, in the scriptures she'd gone to many doctors over the 12 years and could you imagine you're going from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor and having to pay to each one of these doctors to have a look at her and try to explain to her what they thought she might be going through. She had been trying to get well and I'm sure she spent a great deal of money with uh, on these doctors. She was tired, worn out and very, very, very lonely. She was also desperate, which at times our desperation can be a really good thing because a lot of times in desperation, we call out to God. I often say there are no atheists in a foxhole because you know, when push comes to shove, even the, the strongest, the most devout of atheists will cry out to God occasionally. So she was so desperate. And you, know, why was she desperate? Because desperation keeps complacency and self-pity away. And it really does. Desperation does uh, keep, keep, keep that away. So it can, it can be a good thing. Now, imagine her. She went from doctor to doctor. They gave her one thing after another to no avail. And think that no uh, paracetamol, that no um, uh, anodine, that no... Do they still make Fensix today? I don't know. Fensix is no one. The no beach and spiders did nothing like that. Uh, and the no uh, other products and things to ease the pain, the cramps that she would have been going through. And chances are her resources dried up. So the doctors had no more advice and I'm sure with no money and no way of paying them, they didn't want to know her. And... They couldn't give her anything else. There was nothing left to try. They actually considered her incurable. So they put her for a life then to just be locked away in your house, be quarantined for the rest of your life, don't do anything. She was thrown in the scrap heap. But then, wonderful news, she heard people speak of the power of Christ. Now, I know she's not allowed to leave the house, but imagine windows open, door open. She hears people out in the street talking and chattering away. Maybe her husband comes home. Maybe her kids come home and they're chattering away about the uh, about the power of Christ. But anyway, no matter how it happened, she heard about the power of Christ. She believed and began to hope again for an ultimate cure. So that very moment she believed, she began to have hope and she believed and she believed that if she could just get to him, if she could just get to him, just touch the hem of his garment, she'd be healed. She'd been in isolation for so long. I'm sure she felt she couldn't just get up and go up to him and talk to him. Because nobody talking to her. You're going to lose those social skills, how to speak with people. You know, do I just go up to this man of God and say, Hey, dude! I hear you can work miracles. Will you will you heal me, or d 
just you think you do get down on my knees and uh, say, you know, oh, master, master, master. Either way, I'm sure she was in, a, in a, a quandary of how she should approach him. She was embarrassed and needed a private cure as she could get. That's what she decided. She needed it done privately. But how is she going to get Jesus to come to her house, maybe to give her a private cure? It's not going to happen. Well, it would have happened, but she's thinking it's not going to happen. So, only as us women can do, she came up with a wonderful, cunning plan. So she did. And you could just imagine her sitting maybe for a couple of hours or a day or whatever, thinking, you know, now if I do this, oh, that mightn't work. Oh, no, no, no. Well, if I do it that way, it'll work. You know the way we do, we do. And, you know, like, come on. All admitted people, admit it. You're no, you're... I'm no different to you, all of you. You have these scenarios in your head that you will not. If I go down and this happens and somebody says this to me, I'll say that back. We do it. Yeah. Don't we? We all do it. We do it. So I can imagine this woman uh, uh, sit, uh, sitting, planning this out in her head and everything before she actually goes. So she devised her plan and she thought if she could just touch his clothing for just a second. So she pushed her way through the crowd. Now you can imagine the crowd there, loads and loads and loads of people. And remember, if she was seen out in public, if she was recognised, they could have stoned her to death. So maybe she pulled her, her shawl up over her head or something, maybe kept her head low or something. I don't know. But imagine that, she, that this, this is what she's going to have to do. And they really, the crowd could have turned on her very, very, very easily had they seen her. But anyway, she pushes her way through. And I imagine her as a wee woman. I'm only five foot nothing. I'm five foot one and a half. And that one and a half inches is very important. And then when I wear my three inch heels, oh, it's brilliant. So it is. Um, but I imagine her as a wee small woman, lightly made up. And you just imagine her pushing her way through, her, through, through, through the crowd. She was desperate. She was in so desperate to get to just touch the hem of his garment. But she did. She got to touch the hem of his garment. And instantly the blood stopped and she felt perfectly well. Imagine feeling perfectly well, the fatigue going away, the drain, the drain feeling going away, the uh, just total sort of, you know, she'd been down, she had, oh, I don't know, dark circles under her eyes with lack of iron and all the rest of it. But instantly she felt perfectly well. She couldn't remain anonymous. She really couldn't. She wanted to, but she couldn't. So her feeling of triumph gave way to fear and trembling. And what could he do to her? Because you, you remember when she touched the, 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 the hem of his garment, he knew instantly that the power had uh, gone from him and he knew that somebody touched him in faith and he said, who touched me? And the disciples' attitude was, oh, there's loads of people about here touching you, master. Um, uh, it could have been anybody, so it could have. But um, he said, no, somebody in faith. So he knew instantly. And that's then she also knew then to, uh, that she had to stand up and give her testimony and give all glory to God that for her healing. And as she said, you know, what could he do to her? He could shout at her, but he didn't. So she falls at his feet and humbly explained what she had done. And you could still sort of imagine her maybe trembling and maybe sort of holding her hand or something in you or, or whatever. Or maybe she stood up straight and bold and said it was me because I knew I would be healed just by touching the hem of your garment. His response to her wasn't of anger. It really wasn't of anger. It was of delight at her extreme faith. And that's what God wants us to have, is extreme faith in him. Now, what can we learn from the woman with the issue of blood? She was desperate for her healing. So much so, 
she didn't worry about the uh, other people, what the other people would think. Or at least she didn't let her worries stop her. How many times do we stop and think, oh, what would it be like, uh, you know, if, if, for example, some church or something, you want to raise your hands, but no, it's not the done thing in that church. You go, oh, what will people think if I raise my hands? Uh, I don't care about it. If God tells me to raise my hands, I raise my hands. If the people don't like it, their problem. Take it up with God. But that's what this woman did too. She, she went ahead. She stepped out in her faith. And she didn't let her worries about what other people would think or what they would do to her. She didn't let that stop her. She also had great hope that Jesus' power could heal her. Do we have that hope? We're told in the scriptures too. I meant to bring a mustard seed with me, but my day was running a bit chaotic. And I meant to bring a mustard seed and put it in the tip of my finger. But a mustard seed is... Oh, come on, pen, right. Right, a mustard seed is no bigger than that wee dot, okay? In fact, that's maybe too big. That could maybe be two mustard seeds, right? <laughs> um, right, I'll put it put it up there too. That's the, that's about the size of two mustard seeds. And uh, we're told that all we need is the faith, the size of a mustard seed, and we can move mountains. Like when I was a child, I used to think, how can anybody move a, a mountain physically? You have mountains there. Not until I got older and a bit wiser that I realised that your mountain is your problem, your worry, your concern, your spiritual battle. So that's all we need is just that wee bit of faith and we can move mountains. Her faith, I think, was a lot, lot more than that. So it was. But still, that's all she needed was the size of a mustard seed. Now, faith and determination are of great worth. In the Lord's sight, he does. Oh, he loves our faith and determination to, to walk in that faith. Now, without faith, we're told in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Would anyone like to go and get that? So Hebrews. OK, you go for it. That's it. It's impossible to please God without faith. It really is. No matter what we do. It's like even in the fruits of the Spirit and with the gifts of the Spirit, without love, it's all meaningless. Uh, so, and without faith, no matter what we do, we could be doing great things day and daily, doing great charity work, doing great humanitarian work. But without faith in God, it's, 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 it's nothing. Now, the big lesson is know who he is. And come boldly with any request you have. Jesus isn't afraid of the supposed uncleanliness that disease may bring. He is prepared. He wants us just as we are. I often evangelise to people and they say, oh, I need to clean my act up before I come to church. No, you don't. You come as you are because church is a hospital for sick people, for wounded people, for hurt people. And the church is a place to get healed. People with physical ailments need help and mercy. They really do. Not isolation and condemnation. Jesus didn't have to acknowledge this woman. He could have just thought, felt some uh, the faith, the power of healing uh, go from him to the person. He didn't have to acknowledge her. He could have just walked on by. Oh, yes, somebody's touched me. And he could have just carried on his, his, his daily, uh, uh, what he was doing. But he didn't. He knew, he knew it was something special her faith was. Her faith to touch the hem of his garment was enough to heal her. It was enough to heal her. Just touching the hem of her garment. And it seems he wanted to look her in the eye. Not to yell at her for bothering him. The way some pastors, ministers and people and things would do today. You know, I'm, just, I'm too busy, go away. No. 
He wanted to see the beautiful face emanating from her heart. Can you imagine that? That's what he, want. he wanted. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, wanted to see that. And he wanted to acknowledge that she didn't have to suffer anymore. She was free. Physical healings don't always happen. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I don't know why. People have asked me, and I know you've all asked different uh, uh, pastors and your uh, uh, Christian friends and things, why does God not heal everybody? We don't know. We'll not have the answer here in, in the earth realm. The only time we'll get the true answer to that is when we're in heaven, face to face with God, and we ask him ourselves, then he will tell us why. Everything else here in the earthly realm prior to that is speculation. Somebody might get it right. Somebody might not get it right. I'm not going to speculate. I don't know. And keep on asking with the faith and determination of this woman for any healing that you want. Now, if we keep on asking with determination and faith, our healing could come through. As I, say, as I often say, our spiritual healing, we will always be spiritually healed. But physical healing, I don't know why we're not always healed. But that's that's fine. But to be spiritual healed, you can still carry on. You can still function a great life. And even when there isn't physical healing, there will always be a healing of your heart and soul. When you repent, of doing things your way and thank God for making a way for your sin, shame and pride to be completely covered. I think sometimes we can forget that we can become prideful and uh, we think we can do it our way all the time. So we do need to repent and get rid of that prideness. I have it sometimes myself too. My attitude sometimes is really bad. I can be tired. And especially when I'm driving, if somebody is going too slow in front of me or, you know, they're sort of going fast, then slowing down, whatever, I get irate. And I'm thinking, come on, just move out of the way. Let me get past you. And I think, oh, Lord, check my attitude. My attitude is so bad at times. It, it really is. So I, I, I need to repent. I do. But when we totally come to Jesus and repent of all of our things, all of our sin, our shame, our pride, and completely covered. We can be free. And to walk in the freedom of Christ is, oh, it is, it is so good. Can you imagine Jesus saying to you that, and he will say to you, either daughter or son, whoever's coming to him, your faith has healed you. That is brilliant. So it is just, just to hear him say that your faith has healed you. And go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Because that's what he said to the woman, isn't it? He said to their sure of blood, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. We can have that today, mm -hmm. folks. We really can. And what we have to remember is that also in John, chapter 14 and verse 13 we are told that whatever you ask in my name I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son and we're also told in the scriptures as well that we have not because we ask not so when I say come boldly into the throne room of God and ask God standing in these scriptures these promises I don't mean coming in all blasé and all the rest of it, but God wants us to come in standing straight and saying, right, you've said in your word that anything I ask in, in the name of Jesus uh, to glorify you will be granted to me. That's what I mean by coming into the throne room boldly. And we should practice coming into the throne room boldly. Now, I pray, 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 pray with me, folks. Pray, pray, pray. Listen to this. I pray, you, dear Lord, help us to remember 
the great faith that the woman with the issue of blood showed. And to boldly come to you when we need healing of any kind, be it physical, emotional or spiritual, knowing that you will always help us. We can also draw near to other people who are sick instead of distancing from them. We can pray boldly for their healing as well. We can offer compassion and show them they are not alone. I ask this be granted to us all, Lord God Almighty, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm just, I'm just going to say goodbye to folks in the video because I've been recording this for uh, a, 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 another purpose. So folks watching on video playback later on, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. And I really do hope and pray that you all get something from it. And you can leave any comments in the comment box and I will get back to you all about it. Thanks in the name of Jesus. Good night. Shalom.